Okay, so if you're an author, you're probably thinking to yourself, man, Dale, I am thinking about starting a podcast, but what's in it for me? What can I be able to get out of it in a podcast for writers? Well, today, it just so happens I brought on a good friend and a guest expert who actually has her own podcast for writers. In fact, we're going to talk about how to start a podcast for beginners, so you want to make sure you stay tuned to today's video. Hey, what's happening, everybody? This is Dale here, and, uh, you know, today's going to be a little bit of a departure from the normal. Uh, normally, we're talking about getting more book sales, or we're getting keywords, or, you know, getting book awards, but today's going to be a little different. We're going to be talking about a marketing and promotional vehicle in doing a podcast for writers. And I figured rather than me bloviate about it, I, fe I felt like I would bring somebody else on that has a lot more experience being an indie uh, author. In fact, her name is Maddie Dalrymple, and she actually podcasts, writes, speaks, and consults on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. Maddie is a prolific author. I mean, she's got a deep back catalog whose published works across mystery, suspense, and thrillers. Host of the Indie Author Podcast. I've made two appearances on it so far as of today. Maddie has interviewed a who's who list of Indie Author All-Stars since 2016. That is what brings her to the show today. So welcoming on board here, Maddie Dalrymple. Maddie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dale. How are you doing? Fantastic. I'm sure you got to see the behind the scenes. I could see you kind of smiling as I'm kind of going through things and such. Um, you know, uh, you got to see behind the scenes. What do you think so far? Uh, well, it's it's always fun to uh, to talk with you on a podcast, and it's it's super fun to be on one that you're uh, hosting. So uh, so far, so good. Awesome, fantastic. So um, I want to acknowledge the live viewers first of all. Uh, we are going to get to you folks. If you have questions, concerns, comments, load them up inside the comments for us, and we're going to make sure we address those. And this goes for you replay viewers out there. We're not going to ignore you. We want to make sure that you're taken care of as well. So we're just going to segue into things here right away. Um, um, so, Maddie, how did you ever get into self-publishing, and, and what were you doing before self-publishing? Well, I uh, until last year, I was in the corporate world. I was a project manager in the corporate world, and I had this idea in my mind for something that I thought of as a movie scene. Um, it's, being a writer was something that I always wanted to do. My uh, father was an author. He was a short story writer. He got stories published in Collier's and Cosmopolitan way back in the 50s. And he wrote under the name William Kingsfield, which is the name of my publishing imprint, William Kingsfield Publishers, as an homage mm. to my father. But I had really had this scene in my mind that, that I had been thinking about for a long time. I finally got it down on paper, on virtual paper, and then had to write a whole book around it. Uh, which took me two and a half years. And that was my first book, which was The Sense of Death. And when The Sense of Death was nearing completion, I'd gotten it edited. I started talking to friends of mine who were uh, traditionally published about what they were getting from that. And it really just boiled down to the fact that you don't get as much from a traditional publisher as maybe my dad would have in the 50s if he had ever gotten a, a traditional publishing deal for a novel. And you were doing a lot of that yourself anyway, and you were giving up a lot of control. I mean, I think that's really what, what it boils down to. You trade control on the indie side or sort of prestige and a certain amount of reach on the traditional side. And when I thought about it, I just thought that I wanted to have more control over my destiny as a writer. Nice. And about what, when did you start this whole journey? The Sense of Death came out in 2013. Wow, so you've been at it for a good seven years now. Yeah, yeah, and full time at it for about the last year and a half. Congratulations on that. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to make sure we, we could lean on you here and ask you a few questions when it comes to podcasting. So you've got the Indie Author Podcast. What inspired you to start a podcast? I mean, obviously, you already had your hands full with being, you know, you had a job that you had prior to, to leaving this and, and yeah. um, you also had to manage your author brand. So why the podcast? Well, originally it was it was a an outreach effort and there were two drivers. One is that I had gotten a lot of help along the way and I wanted to give back to the community. That was the unselfish reason. And the selfish reason was I wanted an excuse to be able to talk to people about their areas of expertise to help advance my own career. And so early on, uh, the episodes were quite infrequent. 
uh, because as you said, I had a couple of other things going. Yeah. And um, it was mainly interviewing people that I knew through writers groups or uh, met through other authors about things that they were expert in that I was interested in learning about. And then once I started doing this full time at the end of last year, I was able to go on a much more regular schedule. I'm now on a weekly schedule. Yeah. And, uh, but that was really it. It was, it, it was a giving back and then a building community and developing a pool of uh, experts that I could tap into for information and then sharing that information out with my fellow authors. What are some of the benefits you saw from podcasting? Well, I really think that now that I'm trying to make a go of the writing and publishing gig full time, I do think that making a reasonable living as a fiction writer is so difficult. You know, there's this tiny handful of people who are able to do that, but I don't want to count on being one of those people. I think that uh, nonfiction is much more, can, can be much more profitable uh, if you do it well and if you can re re reach the right people. And so I really see the podcast as being sort of the foundation of my nonfiction platform, the indie author, and uh, I'm continuing to be able to expand my network uh, through my guests and through my guests' followers and so on, and gaining that information. And then also hopefully developing foundational information for other things that I can offer to my fellow authors. So mm. uh, books, online courses. Over the past year or so, I've really focused strongly on the idea of community building as an author, and I think we're going to talk about that a lot because it's a very important part of podcasting. And uh, I'm working on a book on building community as an author. And so I, I hope to feed that information that I'm uh, getting to the uh, getting through the podcast, both through the podcast, but also in other platforms like books. Awesome. Do you ever see a crossover of, say, your listeners are obviously probably nonfiction driven, but do you ever see some of your listeners going and buying your fiction books as well? It's so hard to say. I mean, there's this pool of people who are close to me, more like the friends and family circle that yeah. uh, are actually probably more interested in the fiction side. Because I think that if you're talking to someone who's not an author and you're talking to them about, um, you know, aggregators, using aggregators <laughs> versus versus going direct to uh, Agri what? platforms, <laughs> which we, uh, which you and I talked about on the Indie Author podcast episode that went out today, coincidentally, you know, it doesn't mean a lot to them. But it's, it's a great question. It's very hard to tell. Um, I don't know if there's anywhere you could go to find that information other than just anecdotally. But I think that the the key value is that if people see that you're talking about the publishing world and they see that you're doing it, you know, that's helpful. Nice. Good, good stuff. So let's go ahead and break it down for the person that might be new to all of this. Mm -hmm. What are the best first steps for an author to start a podcast? Well, I think it's important to give some thought as to what your plan is for the podcast at a very high level. You know, is it something, do you want to be a solo act? Do you want to have guests? Do you want to have more than one guest? Obviously you want to be thinking through what your focus is mm -hmm. with the expanding popularity of podcasts. It really seems to me that the more niched down you can be, the more successful you can be so that it might take you longer to find your followers, but once they find you, they're going to be super loyal because um, they will be so tuned into what your topic is. So I actually have to say I'm violating this a little bit because as you mentioned, uh, I'm focused on the writing craft and the publishing voyage. That's pretty broad. But I can see over time, if I see that my followers are expressing particular interest in a certain area, I might over time niche down to something more specific. But uh, figure out what you're what you want to talk about and then start pursuing people that you want to talk with if it's going to be the kind of podcast where you have a guest and um, my recommendation is that when you're first doing that look for people that are you're already friends with so if things go awry you know you can take them out for a beer um, but don't approach it any less professionally because at some point 
you know, you think, well, I only have one podcast. I'm just talking to my neighbor who published a book of poetry. How important is it? But at some point, you're going to get big and someone's going to go back and listen to episode one. And you don't want them saying, well, that was an amateur job. Um, <laughs> so approach it professionally, but approach it safely by doing it uh, with someone that you're familiar with and then gradually expanding out. Uh, so, yeah, understanding what you're trying to, to gain from it, too, because that's going to impact how you approach it. What type of equipment is an author going to need in order to start a podcast? Well, I have fairly basic a fairly basic setup. I record, I have a MacBook Air. I record my episodes on Zoom as, as uh, we're using here for this conversation. I mm -hmm. have a, a Blue Yeti USB mic. I have these, um, you know, earbuds uh, uh, that are not mic'd uh, to use for the audio, for my own audio. And then um, a lot of blankets, you know, so that you can create a sound dead in space <laughs> wherever you're recording. Um, I have a, I have, I'm next to a piece of furniture here. I have a, I have a blanket over that. I have a, I got several room dividers, uh, sort of Seagrass room dividers that I have around the desk where I'm sitting to further mm. deaden the sound. And you and I were talking earlier about um, lighting. You know, if you're going to be doing video, have some reasonable amount of light so that people can see your face. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing, so all that can be had quite inexpensively. Yeah. Um, the one thing that be starts becoming a little bit more of an investment is, uh, well, I should say the other thing you need is a podcast platform. That doesn't have to be expensive. I use Libsyn. They have very inexpensive entry level. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Good. And um, and then if you want to edit your audio and video um, and provide a transcript, that's sort of like the other level of, of investment and involvement. So yeah. I use a system called Descript and mm. it's fantastic for people who don't have any audio or video editing experience as I do not. And yeah. so what you do is you take uh, the video or the audio from Zoom or whatever you're using to record, you feed it into Descript and Descript actually creates a transcript for you that's fairly accurate and it ties the transcripts to the audio and video so that if you edit the transcript it edits the audio and video as well so yeah. i remember when we were talking uh i'd asked you a question you were answering it another question popped into my head but then you know i lost it so when you were done with your answer there was this couple of seconds where i was going i had a question but i can't remember what it was and then i remembered it and i was able to edit out I was able to go to the transcript, edit out. I had a question, but I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And it edited it out of the audio and video as well, huh. which is is brilliant. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, it's not terribly expensive. And I don't want to say any prices because I know I'll get them wrong. But Descript, um, you know, you can easily go there and, and, and see what the prices are. But once you start getting into that kind of, you know, uh, more technical side, that's when you decide, is it worth it to be investing this amount month after month to, uh, yeah. does it, does it, do the benefits you get from it pay for that investment? Do you think video is a requirement if somebody wants to do a podcast? Let's say, for instance, there's a lot of indie authors out there that are very camera shy and they're like, Maddie, no way. I'll do a podcast, but video, so is video a requirement? Well, this is one, I know you said this was going to be mostly about me, but this is one I'd like to be more of a conversation because I know you're cool. a video guy. Oh, yeah. And I, I have had guests who have said that they don't want to be on video. Yeah. And my requirement is that we have to be on video for the conversation, but I won't necessarily ever publish the video. Mm. So if someone says they don't want to be out on video, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I want the video because you can just get, you can get cues from people. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're seeing them in a, in a video conference like this that you don't get if you're just on audio. Yeah. Um, what I found, though, was that I don't think I ever watch a podcast. I mean, when I do a podcast, I put it out on all the podcast platforms, Apple and Stitcher and Spotify and so on. And I also post a video of it on YouTube. Um, and I don't I get many more listens than I do views, but the key I think is that I use the video for promotional purposes. So mm. I will clip out little bits and post the little bits of video on, um, on social media, 
with the plan that that will encourage people to listen to the podcast, not necessarily to watch the podcast. And I just ran into this. There was just an episode I did where the person didn't want video put out. And it was much harder to promote it because what I had to do, I did like the idea of using video as an attention getting thing on social media. And Descript has this feature called um, audiograms, which is one of those things where you get the little sound wave at the bottom and it displays the words as the person's talking. So yeah. it's, it's attention getting if you scroll past it on social media. And, um, but you can only do that for short clips. If I'm posting a video, the video might be 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds. You really don't wanna be watching that audiogram for more than maybe 10 seconds. So it was actually more difficult to find things to promote it. But now I, I'm gonna throw it back to you and say, what's your thought about the necessity of video on podcasting? To me, I, I know it does greatly inhibit the communication between host and guest. Um, but I don't try to find that as a deal breaker necessarily. If I'm going to invite, say, for instance, like you, Maddie, I was going to bring you on this channel. It's like, you know, ahead of time, you're going on camera. You're going to be on a live video. There's, there's no ands, ifs, or buts. So if you're going to do a podcast to me, know exactly what you intend to do and just try to stick with it. Um, I think Maddie, you're right on the money when it comes down to having a conversation face to face through a video chat when you're recording a podcast is a good idea as a minimum. Whether you use that video for your podcast is going to be completely up to you. I would rather see that you do something than do nothing at all. So that's that's just my take on on podcasting. So video is it essential? Um, it just depends on how you want to deliver that vehicle. And if putting yourself on video makes you uncomfortable, you break out in hives, you're freaked out about being on camera, then go with the audio aspect, at least at first. And then as you get more comfortable with camera, you're going to be able to eventually roll that out. Thanks for asking that. I think that that's a great, uh, a great point about, uh, the comfort level and also maybe easing into video. My early podcasts were just audio. Yeah. Um, I think actually another benefit though of having video to use for promotional purposes or for those, you know, those people who are watching, you know, they sit down at YouTube and watch the whole thing is I do think it video lets that people connect with you in a way that audio doesn't, you know, being able to see the person's face is different. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that you brought up that I hadn't thought about before, because all my podcasts are pre-recorded, mm -hmm. that um, if you're at all uncomfortable, don't do live. <laughs> and I know I've been a guest on a couple of live events, and it's always way more nerve wracking. Um, oh, yeah. You made it less nerve wracking because you were so well prepared and you sent me plenty of information and I understood the flow and I understood, you know, what was going to happen before I came on camera and, and afterwards. And that was great. But I have done like phone interviews where you just really don't know what's going on and there's no way to recover. Like if something weird happens in the middle, you're just stuck. So um, I would also caution people that if they're thinking about doing a live event as a guest, then uh, consider the experience level and professionalism of the person who's going to be interviewing you because that's really going to impact how successful that experience is. Well stated. Well stated. Do do your own due diligence. Look at the platform that you're going to try to go and get yourself interviewed on. And if you see train wrecks, then, then run away. I, I can tell you there's been a couple of yeah. occasions where I'm like, why did I just do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're getting people set up here with podcasts and you've given a pretty good overview of the equipment that they can do and some of the best first steps. So the big issue with authors is we're already busy as it is writing our next manuscript, editing it, formatting it, marketing and promoting it. How can an author market and promote their podcast without sacrificing all the other things like the time and the money and all of our energy away from our normal projects? That is just a tough, tough ongoing question. And a good example for me is the production of the transcript. So as I said, Descript is the uh, tool I use to do that. And it's quite good. It produces quite a good transcript. Inexplicably, it knew how to spell NaNoWriMo, but it never knows how to spell genre. <laughs> so I probably spend, for every hour of podcast content that goes out there, I probably spend 10 hours on 
all the other stuff. Mm. You know, that the, the actual recording of the podcast is a tiny fraction <laughs> of the time that I'm spending on it. And a ton of that time is creating the transcript. Yeah. And it's one of those things that I can easily spend eight hours on creating transcript. And every time I do that, I think, is this really worth it? And I think that the potential benefits are that um, I think it's good for search engine optimization. So Absolutely. over time, I think that search engines will find my pages and serve them up to people because they'll it'll, they'll be benefiting from all the text that's in there as part of the transcript. Every once in a while, I do have a listener or a reader, I guess I should say, say that they go to the transcript, they don't listen, they read. Um, but it's one of those things. And again, this is something that we talked about a lot in our conversation about how you publish your work. We talked a lot about balancing the benefit you're getting from the time you're investing. And and when I think I just spent eight hours creating a transcript, or I could have just spent eight hours writing. It's something I wrestle with every time. And so if people are in that situation, which everybody is about, is this worth my time? Then maybe think about easing into it and focusing on those things that are less time consuming. Maybe a transcript is something you do later on, or it's something you have somebody do for you. If you, uh, you know, if you have more money than time, get somebody else to do the transcript. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just always a weighing of what you're getting from it. And some of what you're getting from it is the satisfaction of sharing that out with people. You know, some of it is the satisfaction of helping other people, um, but weighing that against the time you're investing in it. And to think about that carefully before you go into it, because you don't want, want to be one of the you know, 75% of podcasts that get launched that never get past seven episodes because the person goes, uh, I don't know, I'm just not that interested. Uh, you know, the producer is saying that they're just not that interested in sticking with it. So again, I think it gets back to thinking about what you want from it, thinking about the time you're willing to invest in it, and then making sure that you're not doing it at the expense of whatever your foundational work is. And for me, my foundational work is my fiction writing. So I sort of weigh everything against, was that hour spent here more valuable than the hour spent fiction writing? Understandable. So you've been doing this for, gosh, going on four years now. And even more recently, you've just brought in just a cavalcade of amazing people within this industry. And uh, I even, uh, we were introduced through mutual friend, I always love to butcher his last name because he knows I know how to pronounce it <laughs> Aww, right. But Mark Lefevre, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> Lefevre. Now I got to say it like that. But uh, Mark Lefevre. I Lefebvre. always think of him standing in like a John Travolta pose uh, when I hear Lefevre. Yeah, Lefevre. Um, but yes, uh, Mark Lefevre, uh, a legendary guy and icon from Kobo, as well as now he works with Draft to Digital. Uh, Mark's a fantastic guy. He's just one example of a guest that you've had on. You've had so many others. How are you able to curate such an amazing list of rock stars? Well, it's got to come back to community building again. And I think that the the story of uh, from from Mark to you is a great example of this, Mark to you and beyond, because I met Mark, I met Mark, got introduced to him and his platform uh, through Joanna Penn of the Creative Pen. I was mm -hmm. been a uh, listener of hers from way back and she had recommended uh it referenced mark in one of her podcast episodes so i went and checked out mark mark has a podcast called uh, stark reflections on writing and publishing and so i became a regular listener of that i became a patron of his podcast and in one of the podcast episodes he uh, mentioned something in passing about short fiction and i had several and can suspense shorts that i had published as standalone ebooks i had reserved one as a uh, giveaway for people who signed up from my email newsletter. And I was kind of wondering what else to do with them. So I sent him an email and I said, Mark, it would be great if um, if you could devote an episode of the Stark Reflections podcast to what can you do with short fiction? And so he did because he's that kind of guy. And uh, I think it was called 10, uh, 10 things you can do with your short fiction, but he did 13 because he's an over deliverer. <laughs> And then I got in touch with him and I said, I think that that's the basis for a book. Um, would you be interested in co-authoring a book? And we ended up doing that. We uh, co-authored a book called Taking the Short Tack, Creating Income and Connecting with Readers Using Short Fiction. And, um, you know, so that was a great 
connection, community building kind of experience. And then, uh, and so I, I try to watch everything that Mark does online. And I think he had interviewed you for a draft to digital live event. Okay. Yep. Or possibly you were on his podcast. I can't remember exactly the forum. But, oh. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed the conversation so much that then I asked Mark to provide an introduction to you. Yeah. And you were nice enough to uh, come on the podcast originally talking about um, using video to connect with people. Yeah. And then just to, you know, like extend the, the line, w one of the references you had made in your discussion was uh, to Jenna Moresi, a fellow uh, YouTuber for authors. Yeah. And I went to uh, Jenna's uh, YouTube channel and I don't think I've laughed so hard. Um, she's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's awesome. She's uh, very funny and also very insightful about writing. Yep. And so I got in touch with her and I said, uh, well, first of all, I told her that you had mentioned her on the podcast. I said, you know, Jenna, you don't know me, but Dale Roberts was on my podcast. And at minute, you know, 27, he mentioned your podcast. And I said, and by the way, uh, would you be interested in being on the Indie Author podcast if you uh, promise not to drop the F bomb? <laughs> <laughs> And she very graciously uh, said she would, and in fact, she did not drop the f bomb even once. Yep. Um, although I did, I did refer people to her channel because if you don't mind hearing the f bomb, she's very funny. Um, and it's it's really just been like that that there has been uh, like each person opens up a network of other people, and I mm. started making it a practice at the end of every episode. I don't do it at the beginning, but at the end. Um, when hopefully the guest has had a good experience, I say, who do you think would be a good guest for, uh, for the podcast? And they have been very gracious in mentioning people and, you know, every, every person, it, like you kind of expand the prestige level, <laughs> um, by asking those people and then asking for introductions, which improves your chance of, of getting that other pe person. And I've also had great luck with that approach of um letting people know when they've been referenced in a podcast so as an example i just had stephen james on uh his was just a recent episode that i put out called uh, 12 surefire ways to kill suspense of your novel <laughs> and um in the in the process of that discussion he mentioned a cute story about robert dugoni's daughter and um i'm a huge robert dugoni fangirl and so I got in touch with Robert Dagoni and I said, Robert, you know, Stephen James told this cute story about your daughter at minute 27. I thought you'd be interested in uh, hearing it, by the way, would you like to be on the podcast? And so he said, yes. And so, you know, each person opens up new avenues. And, um, and I think that if you are professional about it and courteous of their time and you um, you make the, the most use of the material you get from them, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit as well, then you create that good feeling that enables people to pave the way for you to those people who are your dream guests for the podcast. Awesome. Very good. Uh, I, I, I'm excited to see what you have ahead. As soon as I saw Jenna on your channel, I was like, what? is going on yeah. <laughs> that is amazing so um what are some best practices for authors to become a guest on a podcast um because obviously you're going to probably watch this and i can guarantee you someone who's watching this is probably going to reach out to you so what are some best practices well the first thing i would say is listen to the podcast and see if it makes sense mm -hmm. um you know i've i've heard stories of people who do solo podcasts and get pitched for people who want to be a guest on it. Well, if they don't have guests, that's not a good thing to do. Dude, yeah. And make sure that what you have to offer is in line with what that person is, is trying to provide for their followers and their listeners. Mm -hmm. I get pitched a lot by authors who have books coming out. And I was like, I don't, unless you're writing a nonfiction book about the writing craft or the publishing voyage, I don't talk about fiction in that sense. I'll talk about fiction in, in this context of how it applies more widely. So I've interviewed plenty of fiction authors. Uh, I um, 
interviewed a Jane Gorman about a uh, book cover design. I interviewed uh, Jane Kelly about how you do research for books. I interviewed uh, Lisa Reagan about um, her experience with Indian traditional publishing. I'm going to be in interviewing uh, James McCrone about book launches. So it's not that I don't interview fiction authors, but I have to interview them about a topic that's going to be of general interest to authors from a writing and publishing point of view. Gotcha. And so uh, I would say, first of all, make sure it makes sense. And then if it does make sense, make sure you make it easy for them. I recently got a pitch uh, from someone who was representing, she's a publicist for the person uh, who is eventually going to be on the podcast. And it was great. I mean, she was a professional publicist, so she knew how to do this. But, it, you know, it was uh, acknowledging who I was, reflecting and understanding of what the podcast was about, laying out all the links that I needed to understand who her client was and what she could offer and why it's, it was a good match. Um, so those are the two key ones. And, and, and then just be careful about how you send it out because I recently got an email of someone pitching the podcast, but it was addressed to me, but in the body, it was clear they thought they were writing to um, Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon of the Career Authors Podcast because they had never changed the body. It was like, Jay and Zach, I think I would be perfect for the Career Authors Podcast. It's like, you know what? You sent that to the wrong person. They copied and, and now pasted. you're blacklisted. <laughs> they copied and pasted and they didn't, they didn't fix the body. So yeah. um, I think that, you know, there's a, again, a community building consideration that you need to be respectful of the time you're asking. You know, if someone has you on their podcast, it's going to be a huge time commitment for them to do that. Make sure that you have a valid reason to say why it's worth their time. And then if you're a podcaster and you're asking somebody to be on your podcast, it's similarly an investment of their time and effort and energy. And so make sure that you make it worth their time by I think the best thing is, well, uh, approach it professionally, uh, you know, be on time for your interview schedule, but also make the most use you can of the content they provide because uh, I'm planning on devoting a whole chapter in my book on community building about this, that if you just put the episode out there and that's it, you are so dramatically underutilizing what you could do with that content. And, um, what I try to do is for the week following when a podcast goes out, I put out these clips to encourage both to encourage people to come listen to the podcast, but also just to help get the word out about the person who is my guest as an expert in that field. And then uh, I always try to reference if we're talking about a topic. I, I mean, I think this came up with an episode that we just recorded that we were talking about libraries and I had done an interview with our buddy, Mark Lefebvre on... <laughs> Uh, getting into libraries and working with libraries and so i referenced uh, that episode of the podcast i included a link to that episode um, and to mark's uh, book on the topic in in the show notes and so anything you can do to continue to help the people who are your guests you know that good karma is going to help you as mm -hmm. you go forward absolutely okay so i got a real hot one here who is your dream podcast guest and no it's not me <laughs> well, see, it, w it would be you, but you know, the dream implies that I haven't had that guest yet. And so right. you've already been on twice. Mark would certainly be a dream guest. He's been on twice. I mean, I've been super lucky that many of the people that I, uh, when I started out, I would have considered my dream guests have, have come on the show. Um, but I have to say that my dream guest that has not been on the Indie Author Podcast is Joanna Penn of the Creative Penn. Um, she has been, you know, the person that I've modeled my fiction and nonfiction career on in many, many ways. I was fortunate enough to be a guest on the Creative Pen podcast back in May uh, to talk about the uh, short fiction book. Um, but I would love to have uh, Joanna on and I would love to talk to her about uh, futurist topics. So for anyone who follows the Creative Pen, you know that Joanna is very interested in futurist trends. And I would love to have her on and ask her, what are three futurist tr trends that you see coming along that people can take concrete immediate action today to prepare for. So this is kind of like proposing to someone on the jumbotron, right? Because somebody's going to let Joanna know that I just said that she was my dream guest. And <laughs> so I here, have to try to get to her before. Uh, this, this is what we do. Okay. Like uh, someone clipped this video here. Um, Joanna, this is my good friend, Maddie Dalrymple. 
I think you guys Joanna. have met before. And um, <laughs> come on, Joanna. Go on her podcast. Come on. Do, do the Excellent. right thing, Joanna. <laughs> I'm now the I'm worst gonna, hype guy. <laughs> I, I, now I'm turning all red from... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she she would be a wonderful, wonderful person to have on the podcast. But, I agree. You know, there are many there are many dream guests, um, and it's just a matter of time and networking to, to find those people. That's true, and I would love to hear from uh, some of you folks that are watching this live or on the replay. Who would be your dream guest on your podcast? Whether you have a podcast or you don't, we would love to hear who your dream guest would be. Uh, hey, uh, Maddie, uh, we're going to go ahead, go over transition over to the questions here, live Q and A. And uh, but before we do, how can viewers find you? Well, if you're interested in my nonfiction platform, that's theindieauthor.com, and that's indie with a Y, I N D Y. And there you'll find links to the podcast, and you'll also find a developing section called Podcasting for Authors. So click into that if you're interested in that, and if you uh, think of any topics that you'd like me to address in that section, I would love to hear from people. Just click over to the contact tab at theindieauthor.com if you have any topics to suggest, either for uh, the website or for the podcast. And then if people are interested in my fiction writing, that is at maddiedalrymple.com. And I think, uh, I think you have the spelling of my name there. So Maddie with a Y, M-A-T-T-Y. Yes, very good. And by the way, the uh, the link is right below you. So everybody, if you're watching this right now, visit theindieauthor.com for sure. Uh, Thomas A. Bradley, what's going on? Good to see you. Daniel Scuderi says, ever hear of Open Gate Entertainment LLC? They're a new company out of LA that can transform your ideas writing to a movie or TV show. They have connections with production companies in Hollywood. Can't say I have. You, Maddie? No, I have not. Hmm. Molly Sung, it's good to see you join us here. Yes, I'm on time for once. Archangel Inc., Rob. Rob's going to be talking later on tonight, folks. Make sure you tune in, 6.15 tonight, dalelinks.com slash live. It'll be right here on this channel. It's part, this whole thing is part of the big release day. I didn't say anything, Maddie. I completely, where's my manners yeah. and such? Uh, big release day of Amazon Keywords for Books, folks. You can go ahead and pick up a copy over at dalelinks.com slash keywordsbook. So you can go get that copy. It is officially available. And uh, so in any event, uh, Omana says, hello. You do it, says, hey, everyone. And he also says, F-bombs for the win. Um, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, you know, I, I think Maddie and I can, can appreciate a good, well-placed F-bomb. But unfortunately, when you try to keep a squeaky clean, family-friendly product, those F-bombs can kind of work against you. Yeah, that's one of definitely one of those kind of branding decisions you have to make pretty early that I'm sure that if somebody tuned into Jenna's YouTube channel and she didn't drop the F-bomb a couple of times, they would be bitterly disappointed. Um, but then one assumes she's flagging all her YouTube videos as, you know, maybe not maybe not grade school age appropriate. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that that was, you know, it's so funny. Not many people realize actually this channel started out that way where I was not family friendly. It was very adult driven. Um, but I had a very real conversation with a friend within the YouTube business, and he said, you know, you're, you're greatly, sh you know, hindering your ability to grow and reach other people. You know, if you want to keep doing it, go for it. Um, and I was like, you know what? I want to reach more people. So that's why I said, let's stick with family friendly. But it's always funny when people meet me for the first time and they find out that there's expletives that come out of my mouth. <laughs> Um, Tiara Shepard, it's good to see you. Mike Hurd, hey, and by the way, belated birthday wishes. Thank you. I appreciate that. My ideal guest, Mike said, would be Dale L. Roberts. Hit me up, Mike. Uh, I'm there ready you to go. show up. Uh, Algy says, how can I self-publish? You've come to the right channel, buddy. Just look around inside the videos. So um, in any event, uh, if there's any other questions that anybody has, please drop them on in here. I'm going to ask probably one more before we uh, start to wrap things up. Um, in your opinion, what are you mentioned that both of us obviously are in Libsyn. Libsyn is one option. Are there other podcasting platforms people can look into? I believe that Joanna for the Creative Pen uses Blueberry, which is spelled in a funny way. But if you, I'm sure if you search B L U B R R Y, I just yeah. transitioned from Blueberry to Libsyn. Yeah, I, I didn't really look into it because I've been perfectly happy with Libsyn. It's it's inexpensive. It gets to all the platforms they want to. So, um, yeah, I'd have to point people to Google for more information on the other platforms they could look into. Do you know Blueberry is actually local here in Columbus? Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I've oh, actually got to meet the team before. Um, uh, the only reason why I transitioned was uh, Libsyn just had more features uh, for the price. And so 
you know, I think I was spending about 20 bucks per month over in Blueberry and on Libsyn, I was getting about a third as much uh, storage per month. So that's why I ended up moving over to Libsyn. Okay, the Gentleman's Club's got one. I just joined the stream about 15 minutes ago and I feel late. It's all right. My question is, how difficult and time consuming is it to start a podcast on Apple and also Spotify? It's been on my mind for two months. Well, if you go to Libsyn, you would get, get to both those platforms. And uh, for anyone, if anyone is familiar with publishing to KDP, for example, um, in the indie publishing world, Libsyn is kind of similar. You just load the content, except it's much easier than loading a book, but you load the content, yeah, yeah. you load the audio files, you load a description, you know, all the metadata, keywords, and so on. And then it sends it to a number of different platforms, including uh, Apple and Spotify, um, Stitcher. And I think that they're looking also at sending it to a uh, Amazon, as Amazon is getting more involved in... Um, possibly getting into podcasting. Dale, do you have I've, insight into that? It's in, it's in beta right now that they are um, accepting a certain number of podcasts that Amazon's actually going to feed it out over into Audible. Um, but they're right, looking right. at like the reach and such. So yep. you're going to have to probably have a significant amount of traffic, I imagine, before and, and have yeah. pretty good high quality uh, podcasts too. But yeah, I guess that the, that the answer would, you know, independent of the platform is just um, think about what you're trying to get out of it and then invest your time accordingly, you know, maybe start out not focusing so much on those very time consuming aspects like, um, transcription, uh, uh creation. Yeah. Um, for, um, on my end of things, I actually have, um, I have a feeding out to nine different avenues and that's minus the YouTube podcast. Cause I have a YouTube podcast channel. And um, what I did was I took the RSS feed. I originally started at SoundCloud. I took the RSS feed and then I just went to each of those different avenues and I fed that RSS feed there. So if you're like watching this and you're going, I don't know what an RSS feed is, just remember that. All you gotta do is find your RSS feed of the platform you're distributing through and you can just go simply over to Apple and just feed it right on over there. Same thing for Spotify. There's more of an application process involved with Spotify. I think it took them about a week before they actually ended up approving me, but after that, everything is just automated because anytime I upload to my native platform, which is Libsyn now, Libsyn just fires off and it goes out to all those different platforms. Um, there's a lot of free platforms out there, by the way, folks. Uh, one platform to look into, Anchor. Anchor is 100% free. You can be able to use the RSS feed for that to go out to different platforms. So you don't always have to look into the premium options like what Maddie and I do, but just know that free comes at a cost. You do have to sacrifice quality and sometimes you have to sacrifice reach. So for me, I'd rather spend the $20 extra per month to get that reach and get the quality and get it to where um, I'm not having so much hangups and issues because it comes down to, okay, is this worth my time or is this worth my money? And I almost always go, my money, because be honest with you, you can't ever replace time. So that's why I almost always lean in that direction. But excellent question. I'm glad you asked. It's it's. I think that the other thing, if I understand correctly, that you give up with those free platforms is they're making their money some way. And sometimes they're making their money by inserting commercials that you have no control over into, yep. your, into your content. So factor that in as well. Yeah. And see, I have sponsors that I have to answer to. And I don't like having somebody else's ads put on my stuff if yeah. someone's already invested in the sponsorship. Amana asks this, and we're going to wrap up on this question. How do you get used to hearing your own voice? One of the reasons I don't start <laughs> mine is because I think my voice is annoying. Omana, I've heard your voice. You're not annoying. But Maddie, I want to hear from you. It is tough. Um, I think it, you just get used to it over time. It doesn't bother me anymore, although it, it bothered me to begin with. But I think that one thing that I noticed is that as I listen to more podcasts myself, I realized that almost none of the podcasters have sort of a professional audiobook narrator kind of voice. And they're all perfectly pleasant to listen to. I mean, I suppose some aren't, but uh, I think it's just, you know, recording yourself and listening to it helps you get used to it and, and get over that. But I think everybody is always a little bit freaked out the first time they listen to themselves on a recording. Yeah, it's, I'll tell you, I get sick of my own face and my own voice. I'm so glad I've got a video editor now <laughs> that I hand that stuff off to. Um, and then when it comes to the podcast, I just try to quick and dirty is my, my way to go. Some people have watched me on Twitch doing the editing and 
I just go quick and dirty. And uh, But uh, she says, thank you very much. And speaking of uh, Maddie, thank you very much for taking a little bit of time out the day. How can viewers find you again? The IndieAuthor.com, Indie with a Y, and MaddieDownerpool.com and Maddie with a Y. All right, Maddie, thank you so much. I'm going to go and transition on over, folks, here in the very next video here. Actually, I'm going to send you over to my podcast channel. How fitting that I send you to where I actually do my podcast. That's where we're going to go on over there. And this is my most popular video on that channel, and you're going to want to watch that. Make sure you subscribe to it and ring the bell notification icon, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you later this evening.